Well, hi, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me here on November 5th, 2023 for what I thought would be the last day with this radio, but I don't think so. I think this is the second last day today. So there's a, a number of things here, now that I have the radio tipped into its normal position, that I have not been paying attention to. One is a hidden capacitor down under this coil. Not sure what to do about that. It's really hidden in there. And the other one, a simple one, is this great big capacitor. Look at the size of this thing here. And this is just going to the antenna connection at the back. And so the antenna connection comes through this gigantic capacitor and connects, I'm pretty sure, to the coil here up on top. That's an easy one. This would be a tough one. Another thing I'd like to do is uh, experiment with the lights. The, the light bulbs that are in here, on, on, unless I haven't been paying attention, don't work. So I'm going to replace them. I have some LED lights. It might be nice to try in here. See how they show up. And uh, a couple of mechanical things, uh, some uh, lubrication and stuff like that. That's what we got to do. So probably the thing to start off with probably go for the tough thing right off the bat. That's down in here. Let's see if I can move this plate. Yeah, get it out of the way. Uh, let's take a close look at what's going on in here. Why the big cardboard tube? Um, now, now, did they stick the capacitor there? Because that's just really convenient. They mounted the capacitor onto the coil before they installed the coil in the radio. That's probably what happened. And it's probably there just because that's a really good spot to put it. Uh, you know, in terms of work, effort, space, all that stuff. A little dusty in there. Okay. Well, while I got the camera out, the other capacitor, there's the, uh, the wire. Sorry about the focus on this camera. And the wire just comes to this big honking capacitor. Wow. Why so big? It's an interesting question. To the coil, right down there. Oh, somebody wrote something. Six, six A seven. They also wrote something by that hole, or did they? What's down in that hole? Is that one of the tuning? Yeah, that's a, probably an adjusting screw. I think I remember seeing that underneath, seeing the capacitor from underneath. Okay, uh, now some l lubrication things. Um, let's tune this a little bit and just find out where. So all that stuff that's turning is just kind of floating out there. There's a bearing in that uh, cup. Probably see some ball bearings back here. Well, they're down there, down in there. Ball bearings, on the, you see this, uh, let me hold still and let the camera do its thing. Camera doesn't focus well on patterns. Okay, we'll pull it back here. So that, that piece of metal there, this, it's actually a spring pushing, pushing against Hard to see on camera. You see what it's pushing against. It appears to be pushing against the plate, the outside plate. That's a little bit unusual how that's done. Actually, not quite the plate. See, the plates are attached to a center shaft, and this thing is actually rubbing on the shaft way down there. That's more normal. Often there's one on each side, but the other one, if there is one, we can't really, 
can't see it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. There's another one. And maybe the same thing going on this side, yep. Yeah. So those contacts are very important down there and uh, you, as you can imagine they get dirty and they don't work well. Occasionally there's a contact at the far end but there isn't on this one. Just another bearing, not a ball bearing this time. Uh, actually this outside bearing here is actually adjustable usually. Yeah, see that screw there you can adjust the uh, tightness of it. And, and that will cause a shifting of the plates a little bit relative to each other. The rotating plates and the stator plates. Look at the dirt down in there. Wow, that looks kind of ugly. Okay, so we want to lubricate those areas. Here's a capacitor here uh, that's going to be for doing the alignment. Also very dirty. Dirty guys, really rusty. It's a very rusty radio. Okay, and then uh, the... Uh, Tuning piece. Let's look down here. So I, I may not have called this by its proper name. Uh, friction drive, I believe, is the proper name for this. I'm not getting a good look at it. Let me fix the focus on this camera so we can get a good look at that. The automatic focus just it doesn't necessarily pick the item I'm interested in focusing on. So I'm going to turn off the automatic focus here. I'm sure you can hear me clicking away. Okay. There we go. focus is fixed. Well, it's a little more complicated than I thought. First, you can see a track on the big wheel, the big wheel that goes around. You can see this dark track here. All right, look, I, I, I know you know it. I got to point to it anyway. Oh, for crying out loud! That thing <laughs> I'm pointing at. That track is being caused by a small roller in here. Again. The focus just a little too strong here. You can see the roller going though up at the top there. You can see down from up here. No. Okay, uh, well we don't want to get oil or lubrication onto these parts here or they they won't you know it's a friction drive but look how dirty and just and I clean all that dirt away how would I do that blow, blow it away blow it all away I can wipe it off the wheel because the wheel comes right up here just look at the condition of the wheel Just so much stuff collect on this. Holy smokes. That's one dusty thing. I don't know why so much on there. I guess maybe it's been on other surfaces, you know, like I collected on here, but it's been cleaned off. That's probably what's happening. And this just has never ever gotten the cleaning. And you know what that looks like to me? Well, I don't know what to think. That, you know, that could be asbestos. Now, I doubt it. Um, this uh, 
comes with a bottom cover and there's probably no asbestos involved. But I would say if you had an asbestos radio, you had a radio with asbestos sheet in it, uh, like a fire protection sheet, and then you're looking at the chassis and, and you see dust like this all over it, I think the only thing you can conclude or you should, you should think is that, oh my god, that's all asbestos and you don't want to get in there with a brush and start brushing it all over the place. I mean, it takes quite a big dose of asbestos for it, for, for it to become a serious health hazard. I'm pretty sure. I really don't know that. I'm not a doctor. Okay, so we, I see what lies ahead. Uh, I think we'll start with the cleaning stuff. Okay, so I vacuumed it off, dusted it. Now we're going to spray some lubricant. using WD-40. Uh, there's there's other, other things that can be used for sure. Just little tiny amounts. So that, that sound when you tune this radio. Can't, can't, can't really get rid of that. The, because this whole plate is going to make a sound as it's, as the wheel runs against it. Gonna be able to quiet that up and get rid of some of the squeak right in here. Now we can really see in there. Let's take a look. Let's take a look in there. Really, really see what's going on. You see what the roller really is. It's a ball bearing. So that ball bearing has to be it has to be sprung or pushed against the uh, plate here. It's still pretty dusty, isn't it? Even after I uh... yeah, that's uh, okay. Uh, it has to be sprung against the. Uh, There's a bit of spring metal. I, I guess that's what that is. Pushing the ball into the plate, uh, you know, to get the friction going. So the deal with this is, when you get to the end of the road, you can still turn this, and nothing bad will happen. So it, it'll slip at the end. Hard to believe this really works well to me. Anyway, you can see the gearing. Like this is a great big plate out here uh, because the uh, forces involved are pretty weak, actually. So uh, using sort of a gearing ratio to to, to make this you know e easy to turn. Oh, this this fit. Now that's interesting. I can kind of feel what the situation is. Terrible. <laughs> Feels terrible. Still squeaking like crazy. Where are you squeaking from? That could easily be the ball rolling in whatever kind of a arrangement they have there. I don't dare put any oil on it. What about just in behind where the shaft? Yeah, see the shaft. The shaft has a contact point here, which I've oiled, but it has another one in the back there. Uh, I think we do that from in inside, underneath the chassis, and that's probably the one that's given the squeak. And the crummy feeling, the crummy feeling. You turn the tune. You want a nice, smooth sort of feel to it, not a, not a, a jumpy thing. So here, right here, is the, uh, the part I'm interested in. Just a little bit. Still squeaking. 
Yeah, I think the squeak is probably coming from the ball itself. Well, that's a little better. A little. <laughs> you know that thing when you, you used to, how do you judge a car to buy? Well, back in the 50s, you judged it by slamming the car door. That, w that was the information you needed. How'd it sound? How'd it feel? Same kind of thing with tuning the radio. Okay, if we're going to leave that aside now, I think that's enough uh, lubricating. Oh, there's one more spot I'm going to get right here. Got the squeak, but you never get rid of that tinny sort of sound. It's inherent in the mechanism. Okay, let's go after. Uh, let's go after. Let's look at this tough one down here. Uh, I already looked at it, but let's uh, let's look at this again just briefly before I go to work on it. Is it really worth changing this capacitor? Oh, I think so. I definitely think so. so I'm going to try to stick another one under here. I don't know where else you could put it. It's got to go under here. So I've got to be able to uh, solder solder into here. That's easy. This is look at look at look at this. Well, now that's a wire coming up. It doesn't look very happy in there, does it? on the surface we can see the solder doesn't look very good but further into that connection I'm sure it's fine so if we're gonna try to cut this wire uh, I'm gonna try to leave a little bit so I'm gonna want to kind of get right in there once once I cut one end of the capacitor then it becomes movable a little bit this and then find out I can't do anything on the other end and then I'm gonna have nothing there or have to put the capacitor somewhere else it won't be right so let's look down there before I get myself into trouble and uh, get like you know get halfway through something and then realize oh this can't be done I don't want that to happen so we're going down here wires easily visible up on the top there. Uh, pretty sure I can get some cutters down there. Definitely be hard to uh, now. Can I get it out of there? Good question. Still have to come on out, camera. <laughs> it's all tangled in the radio. This one. jumping out over here okay good got it out of there and the way it comes out is the way it can go in Ooh, it's a big long thing it's going to be another one with no value written on it 
true. It looks like 21. So you can see 21 written there. Nothing else anywhere. Number 21. That's not going to help. Okay, we got to find that on the schematic. I should probably should have done that first. Let's go see what we can find on the schematic here. Okay, so I'm looking at the layout diagram here. Here is the antenna coil that I just removed the capacitor from. And it's shown as a dotted line because, in fact, it's above the chassis. We're looking from below. So this would not normally be visible. You can see the wires going through little portholes in the chassis to get up above where the antenna coil is. Where's the capacitor? Now you might think, oh, it's this one right here. No, no, this is something else. This is underneath the chassis. This one was originally running back in here. And, uh, and I replaced this one. It has nothing to do with the one I saw up above. If it's installed, up above and shown here, it should be shown in, you know, dotted line or dashed line style. I don't see anything here. I don't see any capacitor shown here at all. That would, that would be the one in question. Phooey on that. Okay, uh, now we'll look at the actual schematic. So this is the coil we're dealing with here. Um, there's a trimmer up here, which is kind of interesting. We'll talk about this in a second. And But where's the capacitor? There's nothing in here. There's nothing here. There's this guy. The ground. It's possible that's the capacitor. Um, but its connection did not appear to be the ground. Uh, unless one of those two terminals I cut it away from is a grounded terminal. Not very likely. That's possible though. Like here, here's a ground right here that would be right up. So this terminal, you know, you could use this as this. So you can run this capacitor from here to here. And it would look, you know what, look at that. It would look just like it does in the radio. It's running at the bottom of the coil. That's, this is probably it. The capacitor's sufficiently big to be a 0.05, I think. Hard to say offhand, just looking at it. Now what's interesting about this trimmer, look at the range on this trimmer. 75 to 225 that's quite a range most trimmers go from essentially zero or two or three picofarads i can't quite get to zero to 15 20 25. this is a whopper and if we compare it to the tuning capacitor here's here's one part of the tuning capacitor here's the other part and I read this wrong. Oh, I see what happened. I read this wrong. I, I looked over here and I saw the 3 to 25 and I thought it applied to the tuning capacitor. I thought, well, that's really weird because usually they're, you know, 10 to 350. Going 16 to 410 is what it actually is. 410 picofarads. Okay. Okay. Nothing interesting. Nothing terribly interesting. But this is a large range for a trimmer capacitor, which raises some interesting questions too. Why, why the very, very large range? It's possible it's because they can't anticipate what antenna is going to be connected. You know, it could be 10 feet of wire, it could be 100 feet of wire, and that's going to have some bearing on, on this circuit's tuning, and perhaps they need this kind of range to handle all the possible antenna wire lengths that could be hooked up to the, to the radio. My, that's my guess. And this is probably that big, big one was kind of in the middle of the chassis. Uh, underneath it's probably this one not necessarily though uh, here's another one down here 15 to 100 that's fairly large 3 3 to 25 is small this is probably right on the tuning capacitor and mm, there should be another one here's one here on a tuning capacitor and then we have this one somewhere in the radio and this one somewhere in the radio uh, we have we have a couple more in the IFs here, 
that's okay. They're easy to identify. That's not a problem. Well, what to do about this capacitor now? Is it is it a 0 0.05 here? Where's C5? Where's C5 on here? On here. C5. Can can we can we find C5? C8. Oh, the numbers are all over the place on here. Yeah, because the numbering is done based on the schematic. The schematic layout itself has nothing to do with the radio's layout. So that the capacitor could be anywhere in here. C5. C5. I'm probably going to go right by it. Well, okay, I'm going I'm to stop have some coffee. I'll hunt down this capacitor then we'll, we'll carry on. Never made it for the coffee yet. Instead I just kept staring at this until I finally spotted C5. So get written right there. C5 C5. So there it is. It's C5 going across the bottom of this coil. They just didn't picture it. They just noted it here. All oh, those tricky people. C5. And so C5 is this one. So it's a 0.05 and it's going to ground. It's probably going it's got to be going from this terminal over to this terminal. Simple as that. Okay, I know what I'm doing now, and we will do it. Point. Okay, trying to make this as easy as possible here. Uh, that's the replacement capacitor. If I can solder it in here, I can deal with the other side afterwards. Okay. to solder that. I have bags of tubes laying at my feet here. <laughs> it's another another half done thing there. Do you have a lot of half done things around? You know what happens to me is I get busy working on something and then I go in another room, forget totally what I was doing, get busy doing something else. <laughs> Stay busy and eventually get everything done. you're having the same experience. Okay there. Now we gotta work on the other side. Yes, I've mentioned the room effect a number of times. Uh, we all experience this effect where when you get up and run to another room to do something, and when you get there, you can't remember, what am I doing here? And uh, that's known as the room effect. It's probably more pronounced than different people. And maybe as you get older, it gets more pronounced. I'm not sure. Uh, but it has to do with how our memories work, because our memories are really designed to bring forward the memories we need to know when we need to know them. So as you're trudging through the jungle, worried about some animal eating you, and as you travel down the footpath, you've traveled down many times, you come around the corner, you remember. Oh, that's right, when I get here, there's a lion's den over there. I better be careful. 
but then when you leave the lion's den area you forget about that concern and have other concerns because you're now in a new area and that's what's happening to us here uh, you know as we travel from room to room in our house our brains are automatically shifting the memory system that, that, that's why when you return to the room you came from suddenly the memory returns you go oh, I remember now and you run back downstairs and forget again <laughs> but that's okay because you, you forgot you forgot you, you saw something else to do you got busy doing something else you're feeling great then you go back to the room you came from and go oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> wait a minute I, I went to do this and I never did that well anyway that's the room effect nothing you should be embarrassed about I don't think at least that's what I'm telling myself now how are we gonna get down in there there. So, oh, which, which terminal exactly is it? There's two of them right side by side there. Okay, it's the, uh, okay, I see which one it is. Wow, this is not going to be so easy. Oh yes, Peanut. What's up? You see the sun shining out there? You want to be outside? Okay, hang on just a minute. I'm having trouble seeing in here too. Time, time for some new glasses. You know what I might do here? I might just lay. In. I don't know that I can get in there and bend that. Okay, peanut. What is it, buddy? Where are you going? Hey, where are you going? Do you want to go outside, peanut? Do you want to go outside, or do you want food, or do you want lap time? Sometimes he wants lap time. I think you want to go outside in the sun, right? And there's his agreement. <laughs> you saw it. Okay, I gotta go deal with my cat. We'll come back, solder that capacitor in, and uh, presto. Come on, Peanut. Okay, that's the spot I need to solder. Let's see how this goes. Water ready here. Now I don't have enough light myself. You can see in there the camera makes it look like it's bright in there, but it's definitely not. Okay. Try not to burn anything with the soldering on <laughs> Not paying attention to what I'm doing with it. Oh, 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 did I just burn that coil? Oh, 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 careful, man. This is ridiculous, what you just did there. Shame on you. Don't think I did any damage. I just uh, touched the uh, coil there. Oh my gosh, this is not easy to do here. Water down there. Oh, we got it somewhere. You got a great view. I don't. I don't dare look up at the camera right now or look up at the screen. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. Bring it out of there. Okay, hopefully, I did not burn a hole through that coil. I'm sure I didn't. I just tapped it briefly. Okay, now is that is that really done? grab onto the capacitor here and shake it a bit. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Yeah, it's soldered. Good. Okay. There we go. Okay, come on out of there. <laughs> got that wedged in there. So we got this big guy to do now. This big, big whopper. Um, I don't remember seeing this on the schematic. Uh, I just remember just going out to the antenna. I don't remember a capacitor being in here. There's nothing fancy about this, eh? Just comes through here and solders to the back of the antenna terminal. Uh, let's just look at that schematic again briefly. I just want to know whether or not Let's just look. So it shows a coil and a capacitor working together separate from this coil. C47. Um, hmm. Where is C47? Do we dare? Is it, is it, is it this thing here? C40. Um, C40. And there's another one somewhere. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at the radio right now. I don't see one. Oh, maybe it's uh, maybe C. No, no. It's a great big thing. 15 to 100. This is a weird looking thing here. Um. But that's the only adjustable one right there. C40. Well, what's C40 up here? C43, 41, 44, 40. There's 40. 40 is this. Where's this? Uh, is there a chance there's actually a loop antenna that goes on the back of this radio? I doubt it very much. L15. What, what, what did they show down here for L15? Did they show anything? L. Where would I ever find that? L15 with a trimmer across it. L. L C. R and R. L10. Nine. That's the. That's an IF transformer. Well, L15, L15, C47, wave trap. Supposedly on the top of the radio. This, this is it. But there's no wave trap, there's no coil. There's just this capacitor. And it comes straight from the terminal to the back straight to L1. Oh, is, it, is L, L1? L1 the? L1. What is L1? L1. No, L15. L1 is here. So we have a capacitor coming from the antenna terminal straight to here. We don't have this. This wave trap thing is not there. But what is there is this this adjustment, and this is almost certainly for tuning the local oscillator. But there's another one here too. This would also tune the local oscillator. This is tuning the antenna coil here. So I'm now I'm thinking I'm thinking ahead to doing the alignment. Um, Well, C44 and C45, C6 and C9. Funny they didn't call them like 6 and 7 or 6A and 6B or something like that. Well, uh, so this looks to be in series and 
this, uh, this one here looks to be in parallel, obviously parallel with this. So we could have a case where you adjust the local oscillator at the high end with this, and you adjust it at the low end with this guy. I think that's what's going on here. You do that on the broadcast band, and shortwave band's not critical on this radio at all, so there won't be any precision into in it. That's probably how this is done. And the reason I'm going through this like this is I don't have any instructions. I probably do have instructions. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Go, go read the instructions. Yeah, sure, I've got all kinds of instructions here to look at. Okay, not to worry. Well, I'm not worried. Um, okay, uh, so what they've done here is they, they don't have a wave trap. They just have a capacitor, a big honking one. How big is the capacitor here? Wow, that's interesting. Now, if there was a coil here, well, it's just a piece of wire, so low resistance. So this capacitor, C47, C47, whoop. All right, it's a variable capacitor. So it ranges, it ranges, yeah, because it's tuning against this coil. It's a totally different thing going on here from, from uh, this would be uh, 0.07 to 0.2 pico picofarads, pico uh, micro microfarads or picofarads, picofarad 75 pico. I'm wrong at that. Uh, this is actually very very small capacitance. Of course it is. Okay. But what's actually in there is a great big honking guy. So why would they do that? That's expensive. That's an expensive capacitor stuck in there. Well, you know what? Compared to doing this, it's a cheap alternative. That's probably what happened. One of the engineers said, you know, this is nothing more than a hassle. Let's get rid of it. Why a big capacitor? Why not just hook the wire through? Um, not sure I can answer those questions, unless this is all different too. Maybe this isn't really wired this way. Maybe there's a lot of differences here that are not obvious at all. Okay, well, my best move is to cut it out of there and replace it with the same thing again, or cut one leg and test it, because that's a uh, pretty high-quality capacitor there. Let's try that. We'll cut one leg and test it. Cut one, man, i got to cut it anyway if I'm going to take it out. So, what the heck. There we go. It is definitely a big... Honking capacitor. That lay in there anymore. Let's see if we can read the value of it. Paper capacitor it says right on it. Paper. <laughs> Look. I don't think that's a paper out. Maybe it's a paper. Maybe it's a cardboard tube out there. And its value is under all this dirt. Well, we'll measure. Well, maybe we'll find out that way. If we, if we measure it, we'll find out if it's leaky. If it's leaky, then we're, we'll, we'll, we'll junk it. It's got a huge wire on it, too. That's a big wire. What is with you, Mr. Capacitor? How did you get invited into this radio? do this kind of thing with a little tiny capacitor because there's stray capacitance all over the place when you're doing these tests in terms of pico picofarads the big capacitor you can afford to throw a few more picofarads in it and nothing will happen okay so this says it's 252 nanofarads so it's a 0.025 that 5% 0.5% 0.93 ohms do you think, I don't know, is there a problem with this capacitor? <laughs> I'm not sure how to interpret that. Let's do another test on it. Again, because it's a fairly big capacitor, we can afford to use some leads. So I, I'm going to use the uh, high voltage capacitor checker and uh, see if I can 
to dig up some cords here. tiny capacitor you couldn't do this but this is definitely not a little tiny capacitor so what we're doing over here is we're gonna put one lead on the terminal and the other lead on the capacitor here so so this is just across the capacitor okay other leads here what do you say? Okay, so we're going to be watching the eye again. So I can just shade it a little bit there. There we go. Opens right up. What's the rating on that? I think, I think I saw 600. Opens right up at 150. So this is actually in very good shape. Opening right up. Well, not quite all the way. But that, that's pretty good. What's the advantage of changing this capacitor? What, what if there's a tiny leak in it? What if I took the capacitor and put a wire there? Just put a wire through there. How, how would that hurt anything? I don't think it would hurt anything. Um, I think the smart thing to do here is to put that capacitor back in. Uh, signals passing through it, it's, it's no big deal. It's uh, it's not leaky. Its capacitance is more or less the same as what it uh, claims to be. Does it? Is it? We don't know what it claims to be. We gotta find out what this claims to be. Let me just get a little bit of water. Five. I would say 0 0.25 600 volt. Great, great big honking capacitor. Got to be 0.25. What did I measure it at? I measured that. I can't remember. 0.25. I don't think I measured it that high. Let's try it again. Now, hopefully, this capacitor discharged. Ooh, wait a sec. So I put a couple hundred volts on this capacitor. Maybe it still got a chunk in it. I'll hook it up to my little feeble capacitor checker there as I was about to that might just might just blow it up I don't think you can stick 200 volts on these and expect this thing to be happy afterwards okay so chances are if there was any charge there it kind of bled away anyway but we don't know I think I should be safe now okay so 0.25 eh? and what do you say Five is right on the money, actually, isn't it? Yeah, that's very reassuring. That's very reassuring. Okay, this capacitor is fine, certainly for its particular job. It's got one of the lightest jobs in the whole radio. Now, I just have to remember where I got it from, <laughs> where I cut it away from, and. Uh, 
It'll be good. I remember one. Okay, I'm going to solder that back in. And then we'll check and see if I've uh, ruined the radio in the meantime. Okay, got that soldered in there again. And now, the next thing is the dial face and the lights in it. And let's just verify right away that the lights are burned out, because maybe I'm mistaken about that. Just turning it on momentarily. I see no lights. No lights. Okay, so we'll deal with the lights uh, after my coffee break. Okay, let's see if we can pop these lights out here. This one too. Let's check them on the old meter. Yes, stuff is falling. <laughs> I guess that's a uh, entropy doing its thing. And the level of entropy has increased in my shop. Okay. dead. So I mentioned that I have been very fortunate and I've ended a decade, more, much more than a decade of terrible radio noise in my house, in my environment, from my computers. I have eliminated that by replacing these uh, uh, offending computers. The new computers I've got have almost zero, in fact, really just zero RF interference. I'm so shocked by that. I really am. The drop in the noise level in my house way down from computers. In fact, the elimination of computer sourced noise in my house has resulted in other noises coming to the fore. So I've been able to track down another monster source of noise in my house. And these are the under cabinet lights in my kitchen that I installed with a little power supply I bought off of eBay and something in the lights or the power supply or the wiring something is barking out a ton of interference so that's my next target uh, so it's, it's all a good story from the point of view that I'm finally getting on top of the noise in my house but a sad story that's so much because I'm a radio guy so much of my life has been literally ruined by those computers without me fully understanding it, which is embarrassing. Okay, let me get a couple of interesting lights to try in here. I have a couple LED lights we can put in and, uh, and see, see what they look like. So let's, let's see the difference here. Uh, so obviously these are the originals. These are two 6.3 volt LED lights specifically intended to replace a bulb like this. You see the bulb part is smaller. Of course, there's no heat in this and part of the bulb size is to uh, and, and avoid the bulb getting super hot. It's got to dissipate heat. It needs a certain surface area to throw the heat off. The heat actually travels down through the base and gets into here too. And so this is all heat dissipation stuff. Not necessary with these. The thing about these is the, the color of the light, of course, is a little bit different and the brightness is different. And the projection of the light is a little bit different. So these are all differences that we would want to take a look at. If you notice there's only one wire coming to the light bulb. You need two wires to carry the electricity. It's, it's the uh, chassis that's doing the rest of the work. So we'll slide that in. Slide this in. That was pretty easy. What do you think we got now? Okay, with all the lights on in the room. Ooh, yeah, I don't know about that. Now, looking at this kind of stuff through a camera, uh, it can be very misleading. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't know uh, what to think of that. I mean, it's interesting. Um, it's functional. Um, I don't know if that's really attractive, though. Hmm. Well, uh, the thing is, I don't have many screw type 6.3 volt bulbs. Let me let me see if I can like replace one. Let me turn this off. And that was only part power. These things would be even brighter. We gotta see it. We gotta see it. Full power here. Hardly any difference. Okay. Great. Let me get a regular if I can. Get a regular bulb and. Uh, that's going to take a bit of hunting. Which, which, what is this? This is probably a 44 or 47 or something like that. Magnifier. 46. 40, 46. What's the deal on a 46? Okay. This one here. 46. They're identical. So these are probably the original light bulbs. Well, they could have been changed. Somebody could have, you know, one burnout, out, somebody. Let me change one, you change both. Okay, I'm gonna look and just check out this number 46 and what I've got here that I can replace it with. So I have many, many, many bayonet style bulbs and very few screw in bulbs, but look at that, I found a 46, that's good. So let's let's put one in here. Now these 46s, they draw a heavy current, they draw a quarter amp, 250 milliamps. So there's two of them in here, that's a half an amp going to the lights. The LED ones draw very little in comparison. Don't know what they draw, but very little. But they look different, as you saw. And maybe I could do something to calm these, make them cover them with something to kind of calm them down a little bit. Let's compare. We'll have, we have an incandescent on this side and a, uh, a uh, LED one on the other side. So here we go. Did not, it is on. No, it is not on. It did, it did not come on. How come you didn't come on? Didn't make contact. Okay, power on. Now it's on. So now we get a look at the difference between the two of them here. Again, in the camera, you, 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 you're not getting any, any good deal here. There's quite a pattern showing up over here. But the light, the light is a little more general in this area. Here we have this, this fixed uh, sharp line here, which is kind of annoying in a way. Um, a certain amount of this is going to be covered by the cabinet, but not much. It's going to be covered all the way up to here? Probably not. So you probably see a bit of this. Um, I think there's some easy ways I can deal with this uh, to, to make these lights better. And this is a better choice. The LED uh, is going to be a better choice because it's not drawing this huge amount of current. Okay, so I'm going to fiddle around with a few different ways to uh, the filter, control this light uh, so it's a little more Spread out, <laughs> even a little more even, I guess is the word for it. Uh, the simple thing I'm going, I'm going to do some simple stuff here. Okay, I'm going to stop for a moment while I think up some simple stuff. First thing I'm going to try is a little bit of shrink sleeve, just stuck on here, kind of as an experiment. See what happens. Not going to shrink it on at this point. Just going to put it on. Maybe a big hole there. I should be able to get the light back in. Can you stay on? Okay, lights in. Okay, what do you look like now? Ooh, that's a lot better. Still was quite a hot spot right there. Um, it's not as bad with my eyeball as it is on the camera. The camera makes this look 
really hot. It's not. But it's gotten rid of this sudden line here, which I think is a little bit disturbing. So that's that's one way around it. Um, my shop is fairly well lit, and you're seeing that quite clearly. I, th I think that's a good way to go. I, I think I'm going to do that. We'll put in two of the LED lights with the uh, light baffles on them. What, what do you call that? I don't know. I'll have to talk to my lighting technician. This might just pull itself right off when it shrinks. No. There we are. So I've got the uh, light baffles, or whatever you can call it, on here. Now the next thing is, so I'm pretty sure those LED lights are going to last, but they're going to last. Uh, two dead ones here before I mix them up. My next thing is to clean this a little bit. Now, so I'm feeling where the print is. You can feel nothing here. You can see the dust on it. Wow, it's really covered in dust. Um, is, is the print on the back or is the print right in the plastic? really feels like you can wash this. There's no sign of wear on here. This is probably behind some glass uh, in the radio. Uh, so nobody can get at this. So no one's actually gone and watered this thing up. I don't think I want to be the first guy. But there is a little bit of print right up here. I can uh, water that and see if it washes off. This is the concern here. Because uh, to damage this is to ruin the uh, ruin the radio. So. I have to get a little cloth here. Might as well just keep the video going. I think we'll start with just a dry, just a dry cloth here. I'll move the pointer all the way this way. No water. It's just kind of a light dust, if you like. Okay, we're gonna put the pointer this way. Ooh, don't catch the pointer. And we're going to put the pointer back here again. I mean, that's all that's going to happen here. I don't think it's really worth putting water on, is it? Hmm. So there was a dark splotch there, and I wiped it off very easily with just a touch of wetness. So, okay, so I am going to get a little bit of dampness here. Okay, too much water. So I'm, I'm wiping where the number is up here first. Let's see if the number comes off. Not at all. A lot of dirt. Lots of dirt here. My 
I think we can pretty much wipe this guy any old way. Some of these dials, they have the writing on the back of the glass. That's very common. And then you can you can wipe the front of the glass, of course, because there's no uh, there's no print there. But if you manage to clean the back of the glass, you uh, oh, what I wanted to say was, well, sometimes some of these have print on the front and the back of the glass. And most radios with uh, print on the front of the glass, the print is very resilient to cleaning because they knew it was going to happen especially if that glass is actually exposed, you know, right, right out. Uh, radios with the print on the back of the glass, watch out. Um, I've had one that I was being careful with and I managed to wipe off almost an entire number with one, one swoosh. And they found out there's nothing holding the paint on except I don't know, gravity? What was holding the paint on? Not much. So once this goes back in the cabinet, you can't you can't clean this front like this because it's not accessible. This is gonna look lovely. And can you see that there is a map of the world here? Actually it's a map of North America. It's not actually a map of the world. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Hey, we'll turn the lights on and see what it looks like. Oh, <laughs> you're not seeing anything. Let me fix all that. Okay, let's give it a go. You might be saying, hey, what's that string doing there hanging there? That's, that's no string. That's a reflection. A lot of reflections in there. Uh, okay, volume's down. We will actually play the radio this time. I don't think I have the antenna switched on down here because I was listening last night. Turned it off down here, but let's see what happens anyway. Here we go. So we, st we still have two bright spots in here, but it's not going to get any better than that because you know, they didn't really do a lot with these light bulbs. Unless I put a, a, a hard block between the bulb here, uh, something I won't let any light through. Hey, radio. You want to play something for us? Okay, so let's fix the volume control now. Volume well, control is hard to turn, probably needs a bit of lubrication where the shaft enters here. Just a dab. And the scratchy noise. I'm going to get rid of this way. Whoops. You know, it's gone, but the problem I have is the whole radio is not working again. <laughs> what happened to you? Well, maybe it's because the antenna is turned off, so I'm going to run and turn on the antenna and hope, hope, uh, hope. Okay, let's give it a go now. So we're on the AM band. Oh, oh my gosh. Way up here, eh? So this is something really uh, exciting for, for me. I've been doing this work for a long time and I've had that interference from the computers the whole time I've done this stuff. And every time I've tested a radio, get pick up one or two stations down here, maybe with a loop antenna, if you're a little bit lucky, you fight your way through the interference. Nothing anywhere else ever. Look at that. Yeah. Beautiful. Daily 
It's unbelievable. The American station because they were talking about religion. This is just working great. This French station, I used to just barely be able to pick up and I used it as the test case for radios. Now, I knew all the radios worked well when I took them out of here and, and put them outside or in my garage or somewhere away from my computers, basically. And you know what? We're running this whole thing with the dim bulbs in. So the actual voltage supply is low. Beautiful. This is a 820 from Hamilton, Ontario. This is a comedian, a comedy station. It's always. I'll give it to you one more time. It's one eight hundred. That's okay. We don't need it. Once was enough. Economy that is necessary, and okay. so right now it seems that they've done enough to basically slow the economy to a halt. Gregory is with BMO Capital Markets, and at the Business Center, I'm Chris McCusker. Do you feel like your debt is out of control? You make payments <laughs> month after month. Yet your debt grows larger and larger. I'm Mike Chande, a licensed insolvency trustee. I can help you break the chains of debt and be debt free. You okay, can, eh? You gonna give me some money? So, 680. That's what we're listening to. 640 would be next. You can have the elegant emerald cup. Can you guess the colors? 610. Six ten is from St. Catharines. St. Catharines is close to Niagara Falls. DJCL Toronto. You're on Sportsnet 590, the fan. And this is CBS Sports Radio. And one more station. Buffalo. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. That is the best any radio has ever done in my shop. And again, it's, it's partially because the radio is working really well, but it's also because of the reduction in the tremendous noise level in my house and the improved antenna I'm using, which is feeding a pretty strong signal all the way down to my shop here. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot for watching. Tomorrow, what are we going to do? We're going to align this radio? Why would I align it? It's right on the money. Well, we will check that anyway. So I will I will put the uh, uh, base back onto it. Uh, I need the base on to do the final alignment. And then uh, that'll, that'll be it for tomorrow. And that'll be it for this radio. Fantastic. What a journey this one has been. Fantastic, though. Thanks a lot for watching, and uh, tune in again tomorrow. See ya.